Welcome to the Sui Generous Show, your unique perspective on everything you need to know about your civil rights and the criminal injustice system. With Erica Merrill, I'm attorney Brian Jones, criminal defense and civil rights warrior. Today in segment one, we'll be talking about three officers charged with the wrongful conviction of a Pennsylvania man. The lawsuit that was filed by the parents of Anthony Huber against the Wisconsin police. And we're going to catch up on the opening statements in the prosecution of R. Kelly. During segment two, as promised, we'll be looking at ignition interlock devices, the industry that supports them, and how they affect your family's ability to move around your area. Don't miss an episode by subscribing to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. We have channels on all three platforms. Look to the law office of BrianJones.com and all of our social media outlets for everything you need to know about your civil rights and the criminal injustice system. Erica, did you see in the news this week, the three former police officers charged in the wrongful conviction of a man that was sent to prison for 25 years for a crime he didn't commit? I did. And, uh, you know, reading the details of this case was really difficult. And I know you were going to tell us why. So what were the officers accused of doing? In 1993, three Philadelphia detectives coerced a confession out of Anthony Wright. They were investigating the rape and murder of a 77-year-old woman, and they coerced 20-year-old Wright into the false confession. The confession has since been proven to have been completely fabricated by new detectives who have conducted a proper investigation. And we know that the confession was false because the three detectives back in 1993 had incomplete knowledge both of the crime itself and of the crime scene. They never did a proper investigation in the first place. The detectives in 1993 used illegal coercive tactics, including threatening to pull Anthony's eyes out and skull fuck him and coercing him into confessing under threat of physical harm. They promised that he could go home if he signed the confession, and they made him sign the confession without being able to read it. The 20-year-old Wright, obviously traumatized, distressed, and terrified by his treatment at at the hands of these police officers, spent hours crying for his mother, who could hear him through the walls of the police station, but was denied access for the entirety of his interrogation. After he signed the confession, He was immediately arrested and hadn't seen the outside of the world for 25 years. Now, immediately after he signed the confession, one of the detectives executed a search warrant and claimed to have found evidence of items in Anthony's room in his home. We now know that evidence was planted by those detectives. In 1993, a jury convicted Anthony Wright of murder and rape and sentenced him to life in prison. He narrowly escaped the death penalty. In 2014, after extensive litigation by Ohio's own Innocence Project, Anthony Wright's conviction was overturned based on DNA evidence that proved his confession was false and that the clothing submitted into evidence back in 1993 was not his and in fact identified somebody else as the attacker. Now, despite all of this evidence, prosecutors are going to be prosecutors. And the Philadelphia district attorney back in 2014 put Anthony Wright on trial again, using perjured testimony, using fabricated evidence. And they tried to convict Anthony Wright again, knowing that DNA evidence had exonerated him. Well, after a withering cross-examination by Anthony's attorneys, the detectives were completely discredited, and the jury found Anthony Wright not guilty of all charges after less than an hour of deliberations. The judge immediately set him free after over 25 years of false imprisonment. I mean, this is the kind of story you just don't want to hear. It sounds like the essence of everything that we fight against um, in, in making sure that people have their civil rights. So how, after all of this time, besides having the DNA evidence 
uh, how did they find out about the actions? Like, how did they know that this was a coerced confession? A newly elected progressive prosecutor, Larry Krasner, had run on an agenda of reviewing wrongful convictions. He created a conviction integrity, the sole purpose of which in his prosecutor's office is to review cases and make sure that they are based on real evidence, truthful testimony, and that they weren't falsified in some way, that the convictions actually are based on law and fact. To date, that Philadelphia prosecutor's office has exonerated 22 prior convictees, 18 of whom were black men. Now through the process of their investigation and confirmation of the integrity of thousands of cases, this case stood out as three detectives falsified evidence, lied on the witness stand, and the prosecutor's office through Larry Krasner charged these detectives for their work on this case and four other cases that the Conviction Integrity Unit reviewed and overturned. Well, thank goodness for Larry, because <laughs> it sounds like he's really making a lot of positive changes and and changing someone's life. I mean, this poor kid hasn't seen the outside for 25 years, wrongfully convicted, and now he has his life back. Thanks to prosecutor Larry Krasner. That's wonderful. Um, so what criminal charges were filed in this case? Yeah, so a couple of things, Erica. One, to be clear, uh, Anthony Wright went to trial a second time in 2014. So it was the work of the Ohio Innocence Project and his defense attorneys that secured his freedom. We want to praise Prosecutor Krasner for uh, holding these lying police officers accountable. And he has charged them with perjury and false swearing um, in the Philadelphia courts. Now, Prosecutor Krasner has noted that they're going to be held accountable for their lies for their deception, for their betrayal of the public trust. He condemns their actions and he condemns their actions in trying to convict an innocent man and then cover up their, wrong, their wrongdoing for decades, thereby perverting the integrity of the law. Now, while prosecutions of police officers are, are very rare, this case establishes a precedent and it provides some small measure of justice for Anthony Wright for the appalling and cruel choices made by these detectives. Thanks for that clarification. I mean, obviously we wanna thank and praise everyone involved in getting him free. And um, I know that the Innocence Project has done a lot of great work toward that end. Um, and thanks for the update on this case. Absolutely. And Erica, the last thing I want to say about this topic before we move on and is this is why elections matter. And this is why electing prosecutors who want the position not for the rung in the political ladder that it represents, but rather for the integrity of the justice system. Prosecutors that firmly believe and embody the ethical code that requires them to seek justice rather than convictions. You know, it's easy for prosecutors to pay lip service to that. And they trot it out in press conferences when they have to dismiss a case. But rarely do you see a prosecutor, um, a, a prosecutor like Mr. Krasner, who actually lives that code. So elections matter, get out there and vote and find out in these local elections who you're voting for, what their track record is. Do they have integrity? Because just like Anthony Wright, you could be the next person to spend the next quarter of a century in prison for something that you didn't do. Now, speaking of people who have suffered consequences for doing nothing wrong, Anthony Huber 
paid the price of his life at the hands of Kyle Rittenhouse, who is now the central figure in a lawsuit against the Kenosha Police Department. Have you seen the news of this new lawsuit filed, Erica? I have, and, and I find it very interesting. I know we spoke about this last year. So what kind of lawsuit has the family filed? The family filed a multi-count complaint alleging civil rights violations under the United States Code Section 1983, 1985, and 1986. Now, we often talk about 1983 violations on our show. The 1985 and 86 violations are a little bit, uh, are, are less frequently used. And so I want to give a little background on those. So we all know a 1983 action is a civil lawsuit brought to, uh, to provide some vindication to the victims of civil rights violations that occur at the hands of, of state actors. Now, a 1985 action takes that same violation of civil rights, and it says, not only do you violate my civil rights, but you conspired to do so. There was an organized group of people who came together and made a conscious decision to take the Constitution and shred it and throw it in the dustbin. Now, a 1986 action is an action brought when police or any government official fails to prevent some foreseen harm, harm that they should have known was going to happen, and lo and behold, it did. And we're going to talk about the details of these in, in just a minute. But remember from our chat about civil rights that these actions were created in response to the Jim Crow laws of the South and the racist abuse and its toleration by police officers across the nation. So these laws were specifically enacted to combat exactly this kind of behavior. So can you tell us a little bit more about you know, which civil right has allegedly been violated? I think we've, we've got a couple here. First, Anthony Huber was lawfully present exercising his First Amendment right to assembly, to speech during the Kenosha, Wisconsin protests. Now, you'll recall that those protests were in, in response to the murder of George Floyd when he was fatally shot by police um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, now, Anthony Huber was allegedly murdered by Kyle Rittenhouse. And Kyle Rittenhouse claimed that he was deputized by the local police when he was roving the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin with a semi-automatic rifle playing Call of Duty cosplay. The lawsuit alleges that by allowing Kyle Rittenhouse and his fellow vigilante Call of Duty cosplay friends to roam the streets of Kenosha armed, wearing body armor, and with the alleged endorsement of the Kenosha Police Department, these armed individuals were permitted to act in an unlawful manner under the color of law. And the Kenosha Police Department neglected to prevent the murder of Anthony Huber. By allowing Rittenhouse to escape unconfronted, unrestrained, with a video recorded nod and a wave, these police officers participated in a conspiracy to allow Rittenhouse and his friends to murder innocent civilians in the streets of Kenosha, thereby violating his civil rights. Wow. I mean, I, I can't help but point out that this, this seems like every parent's nightmare that lets their kids play these violent games and and without explaining the reality versus the fiction of it, I, I'm just shocked that this would happen and that the police would allow these people to go and do this and, and get away with going too far. Um, so can the police officers be sued 
for someone shooting another person if they told them to go out there and do it? Under these code provisions, absolutely. 42 United States Code sections 1983, 1985, and 1986 create these causes of action. Under 1986, anyone who has knowledge that a wrongful act is about to be committed and having the power, the government authority to prevent those acts and is negligent or refuses to prevent those acts is liable for the injuries that are caused. So in this case, the police officers knew Kyle Rittenhouse was armed. They knew he was going to go out with the intent to arrest protesters, but he didn't have any handcuffs. He didn't have zip ties. He didn't have any way to take these people into custody. The only force that he could use was deadly force. So the officers had full knowledge that they were unleashing unlicensed, untrained individuals with the intent of having them murder the civilians that were protesting the police's gross abuse of power. Now, under 1985, if two or more people conspire to deprive anybody of the equal protection of the law, they're going to be liable to the injured party for the damages that caused, I'm sorry, that were caused by their failure to act or by their conspiracy. So in this case, the officers, again, knowing full well what Kyle Rittenhouse's and, and all of his cronies' attention, intentions were, knew what was going to happen, knew that people would get shot, and they failed to prevent that injury. So they're liable for it. And of course, under 1983, whenever somebody acts under the color of law, you're wearing that shield, has deprived a person of their civil rights, the right to life, the right to liberty, is responsible for the consequences of that deprivation, in this case, the death of Mr. Huber. So, you know, can they be sued for this? Absolutely. Should they be sued for this? Absolutely. Not only should they be sued in their capacity as law enforcement officers, not only should their department be sued, they should be sued in their individual capacities for intentional torts. They should have judgment slapped against them they cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. They should be driven to absolute ruin because they forego their rights to live in this society when they swore an oath to protect it and they violated that oath. I, for one, hope they are also criminally prosecuted alongside Kyle Rittenhouse because their behavior is disgusting and they deserve every consequence that they get under the law. Wow. You know, I hadn't even thought about that, but discharging your law fees, I, I assume you're referring to in bankruptcy, um, it kind of gives them a bulletproof vest to do what they want without a lot of consequences, as long as they don't end up going to jail as well. Typically, these lawsuits, Erica, are brought not only against the officers in their official capacity, but also their supervising department, because these suits require the investment of tens of thousands of dollars in funds and thousands of attorney hours to bring to conclusion. And individuals, these individual officers, likely don't have deep enough pockets to make that worthwhile. It's a, it's a cost negative uh, endeavor if you're just going after these individuals. Now, there's the satisfaction of driving them into financial ruin, uh, but that satisfaction doesn't, uh, it doesn't compensate Mr. Huber's family. So the lawsuits are typically brought against the municipality, uh, the city, the police department who have insurance policies so that there is financial compensation available. In this case, my position is that 
not only should those departments be sued so that there is financial compensation for the family, but these individual officers should be driven into financial ruin themselves because they knew what they were doing. They knew that they were unleashing a madman onto the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin with intent to murder, with intent to do serious physical harm. And it's their sworn duty to stop that. They forfeit their rights to all of the all of the plunder that they have accumulated in all of their years of being police officers by their actions on that night. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I I wish the same thing. I mean, that is just the core of evil, uh, what they did, and they absolutely knew what they were doing, and uh, they should be punished to the, the very highest levels. Last but not least, Erica, did you see that R. Kelly's trial started this week? I did, and um, do you mind just going over again, like what exactly he's being sued for? I know we talked about this before, but it seems like there's, there's more to it than we originally spoke about. R. Kelly is being criminally prosecuted for sexual assault, child trafficking, and racketeering. The federal government is claiming that R. Kelly is a criminal organization whose primary purpose is the trafficking in underage people for R. Kelly's sexual gratification. I mean, we see this corruption sometimes with famous people, and it's 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 highly disheartening to, to see them just take their power and use it in such an evil way. Um, and I know that that's all allegedly, you know, what happened. So what are your thoughts on the defense attorney's opening statements? Um, you know, Erica, unfortunately, in this case, the defense seems to have had some missteps during their presentation. And it's resulted in a lot of derision in the media and even in the courtroom. Now, attorney Osorio often jokes that she's not delivering an opening statement until the state makes an objection. And there is some danger in having repeated objections and more importantly, getting scolded by the judge during your opening statement. And those instances can be used to the benefit of your client but it must be done artfully. Nicole Blank Becker is R. Kelly's attorney and she holds herself out to be a sexual assault defense attorney. Uh, she practices exclusively in this area. Uh, she's, she claims herself to be a former prosecutor with several decades or two decades of experience, uh, both prosecuting and defending these, these allegations. And you know, misspeaking mistakes they happen to the most polished of us. They happen to the best of us. And even an experienced performer can make a misstatement and recognize it as a cue to slow down, to regroup, and continue with clarity and, and polish. But Miss Blank Becker's accidentally calling women girls when her client's on trial for sexual assault of a child. Um, is, is a serious problem. Um, accidentally asking the jury to convict your client rather than to acquit them is a major problem. Um, and, and I think, you know, while, while a defense attorney has to have thick skin and the derision from the media and the scolding, the repeated scolding from the judge in this case, can't she can't allow it to get under her skin um it's it's definitely a problem and it's not starting r kelly's defense out on the right foot that's for sure wow I, that's amazing those are awful mistakes to make i i know that when you are preparing for a you know an upcoming trial there's a lot of practice involved and a lot of you know, going over your statement over and over again, and you even uh, work with your clients to make sure that you can really minimize those types of mistakes. Is that true? We do, Erica. And cases of 
uh, this breadth, cases of this uh, high level of consequence, we frequently will run our entire trial in front of um, a, a jury, a, a mock jury. What is working? What is not working? Um, oftentimes, we'll give the opening statement multiple times with different variations. What was effective? What was not effective? Um, we'll do the same with every aspect of our case because that's the level of preparation that is necessary. Um, and when you're going up against assistant United States attorneys, and especially United States attorneys who know that they are going to be on a national stage, the United States attorneys for uh, the Eastern District of New York there in New York City, uh, my guess is, is that that's the level of preparation that they'll have put into the case as well. Um, I know the United States attorneys here in Central Ohio put in massive hours in, in preparing their case. And whenever you know you're going to be on a national stage like this, um, you, you do need to be prepared and you need to have practiced. You can't have the first time that you're giving an opening statement be the opening statement that you give uh, to the jury in, in this case. I mean, R. Kelly's life is, is on the line. So um, yes, to answer your question, we absolutely will have given that opening statement several times before we stand up in the courtroom to deliver it. And that's amazing. I mean, this could be a false accusation. There could be lots of things in play here. And R. Kelly's life, as you said, is in the balance. Do you think he's going to fire her for that? It would be very difficult to fire your attorney effectively in the middle of a trial. Um, you know, there's, there's the old cliche, Erica, that you uh, don't trade horses in the middle of a race. And if you think about a horse race and you think about the... <laughs> the process of a jockey switching horses in the middle of a race and how that's going to go, likely with the jockey ending, uh, ending up with a mouthful of dirt uh, in a best case scenario or trampled in the worst. I, I think a defendant in the middle of a trial would have a very difficult time changing attorneys. And you bring up an interesting point, Erica, you know, <laughs> that is, is really lost in all of this discussion of the theatrics of this trial, R. Kelly has been falsely accused in the past. This is not the first time that he has faced trial on these sorts of charges. Um, he's, he's a very quirky individual. You know, R. Kelly won't fly. He refuses to take airplanes. Um, he's very eccentric. Um, and if you, you know, the funny thing is, is that when you listen to the explanations for the behavior that the government says is, is the controlling and manipulative and abusive behavior, it makes sense. Um, it's quirky, it's weird, but when you think about it in terms of R. Kelly being a multimillionaire, a superstar, um, you know, having an amazing singing voice, an incredible talent, women, especially young women, are going to want to be around him. And what level will they submit themselves to? What, you know, how much eccentricity will they allow to happen uh, in order to be a part of his life? And I don't know the answer to that question. You know, you don't know the answer to that question. That's the question that's being answered in this courtroom um, in the next, in, in the coming days and weeks. Uh, but to have that story told, it must be told consistently because we are talking about eccentricities. You're asking a jury to find that while weird, your client is not criminal. And that is some of the, some of the most difficult and nuanced defenses to be put on. Well, that makes sense. So what can a defense attorney do to recover if their opening statement does not land well with the jury or the public and media? Well, Erica, the defense attorney has to have a thick skin. And I'm sure Ms. Blank Becker has thick skin. Um, the public and the media shouldn't matter to her. What the public and media are saying shouldn't affect her. It shouldn't change her trial strategy. 
We'll see if it does, but it shouldn't. Um, she should have a clear plan for how she wants to tell R. Kelly's story. Now, recovery with the jury is not a foregone conclusion. And in many situations, it's not in the attorney's control. You know, you'll remember that from our prior discussions that voir dire is the only opportunity for the jury and the attorneys to communicate with each other. The rest of the trial is the attorneys teaching and telling the jury their client's story. But again, their best chance for correcting mistakes like this is in that moment. So, you know, has that moment passed? I don't know. Um, but acknowledging the mistake, having a little bit of humility and saying, gosh, you know, I, I don't want you to convict my client. I want you to acquit my client. It's not like everybody in the room didn't hear it. You can't pretend it didn't happen. You know, I think last but not least, Erica, when trying to build credibility with the jury uh, after the mistakes that were made here, it's important to be consistent. So coming through in cross-examination with the points that you promised in your opening. And then you've got an opportunity in closing argument to acknowledge the errors um, and being honest, you know, coming out and saying, I'm sorry, I, I, I messed up in opening statement. That moment was bigger than me and I'm gonna do my best to meet it now. Please don't hold that against my client goes a long way towards building credibility with the jury. And that's what's most important for a defense attorney, credibility with the jury. Because at the end of the day, they're the only ones that can set your client free. Oh, I agree. And, you know, I really loved your quote um, from one of the last couple of interviews where you talked about, you know, one of the best ways that you pick a jury is, you know, just really by you know, finding the people that you can form a relationship with per se and build that trust and, uh, you know, really helps make your case go a lot better. 100%. And that was a featured topic from just a couple of weeks ago. But today our featured topic is ignition interlock devices. So Erica, let's move on and discuss the interlock device. Now, this is a breathalyzer that's installed in your car for the purpose of monitoring a driver's alcohol use. A driver has to blow into the interlock device before the car will start, and they have to continue blowing in the device at random intervals as they're operating the vehicle. The device tests the driver's breath alcohol concentration and will prevent the vehicle from starting if there's alcohol on the driver's breath. So with that background, Erica, let's talk about ignition interlock devices. You know, I was so excited when I saw this was coming up because the interlock devices have been talked about for years before they were put into place. And you are about to really shine some light on, you know, what kind of effect that has on people's lives. So, I mean, first of all, uh, how can the government require you to install something in your vehicle that can keep it from starting? Well, first and foremost, driving is a privilege. There's no constitutional right under the state or federal constitution to operate a motor vehicle. Installing an interlock device doesn't prevent you from owning a car. It only prevents you from operating a car, which is a validly sanctioned, regulated behavior. The government can therefore limit your ability to drive a car, limit your privilege to drive a car in order to ensure public safety. And they can do so with interlock devices, which serves the public policy prerogative of protecting the public from a, accused and convicted impaired drivers. Now, all 50 states have inter, in, ignition interlock laws on the books, and 14 make those devices mandatory in many circumstances. In Ohio, in particular, judges have the option to put 
an interlock device, even on first time offenders. And in subsequent offenses, they become mandatory for you to have any limited privileges after you've been convicted of an OVI. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, so just curious, like what effect do these devices have on people who are required to install them? Well, I, they have a variety of effects. And, and I think you know, the first problem with these is that the, the device affects the operation of the vehicle. And in most cases, the vehicle is damaged beyond repair uh, by the installation of the device. The device has to be bolted onto the car. And in many circumstances, that in itself causes damage to the car. Now, a device that prevents a vehicle from starting can prevent a driver from seeking emergency medical care or assistance with uh, you know, household needs. And that can be a significant hardship for people who live far away from cities, rural drivers. The fees associated with installing and monitoring these devices trap low income drivers in a cycle of owing costs, violations for failing to pay those costs because then the device is turned off and now they've got a probation violation or they lose their ability to drive under their limited privileges. So now they can't go to work, which causes them to lose their job, which is another probation violation and lands them up in jail while wealthier drivers can simply pay to play. A low income family may only have one car that is now subject to that interlock device and inconveniences everybody in the household, while wealthier drivers can have multiple vehicles to choose uh, which one to install the device on. And while the device will not start if the breathalyzer defects, detects alcohol, um, it cannot stop the car once the car is already in motion. It can only register the violation. There have been instances of drivers asking others to blow into the, into the device as they're rolling down the road. And I think maybe the biggest problem with this is that the devices are controlled by a network of state-approved manufacturers. And there's a limited market uh, of people that, of companies that install and monitor these devices. It's almost a state-sanctioned monopoly. And in terms of price of installation, the 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 price of maintenance and the price of replacement of defective devices, all of that is passed on to the consumer, the involuntary consumer. And so we've got state sanctions, uh, state sanctioned approval of a, a corporate entity and, and essentially creating a cottage industry out of, um, out of government approval. And, and I think that's, that's really problematic. So, you know, the effect that these have on both individuals and society is, is wide reaching, Erica. You know, I hadn't thought about that, but in so many cases, in some of the examples, uh, you know, usually the people that are wealthier do get off easier when it comes to the criminal justice system. And that is an inequality that should not stand. I think you're right. It's, it's a sad state of affairs. Um, you know, I will tell anybody that will listen to me that public defenders are, you know, absolute angels in the legal system. Um, they are likely the lowest paid attorneys uh, in the United States. They protect more important things than the highest paid white shoe corporate firm lawyer will ever consider looking into. Um, and, and they're just absolutely abused, both financially and in terms of caseload. And, and that's a shame. That's something that our country should be embarrassed about. Oh, I agree. And I am embarrassed. Um, so what happens if you have an interlock device, but it malfunctions and falsely accuses a driver of having alcohol in the system? I mean, much like if you take a breathalyzer and it hasn't been calibrated in a while, it all of a sudden it's got a false positive. Well, you hit the nail on the head right there, Erica, is the, these devices are fundamentally flawed from the foundational science that they're based off of. Um, notwithstanding that, you know, stationary breath alcohol measurement systems 
don't have all of the problems of being driven down the road and by almost saying all over the place and all the mechanical problems that that level of vibration causes to a finely tuned instrument conducting uh, a series of scientific experiments. Oh, so there's a variety of fundamental issues with the reliability of these machines, first and foremost. Secondarily, you are now passing on to private corporations the duty and obligation of calibration and maintenance, which is required for that which we entrust to government entities, particularly law enforcement. Um, you know, do you trust a private entity that has a financial interest in reducing the cost of maintenance, in reducing the cost of calibration by essentially not doing it? Uh, installation itself is a critical moment, and one mistake can cost a driver not only their vehicle's battery, which can get drained and uh, damaged and destroyed by these devices, but their freedom as well through an improper violation. And all of these violations come with the right to challenge them. You can fight them in court, and you've got to have an attorney that understands how these devices work and the places where these devices can demonstrate errors so that you can check for them when defending yourself in court. Anybody who receives a violation for uh, you know, testing positive on an ignition interlock device must contact an attorney immediately. You can't let them get the device out of your car because the device itself is the evidence. Its installation is the evidence. So you've got to contact an attorney immediately, get them retained, get them out to look at that device. I think that's incredible advice uh, because you're right. I mean, why would they take the time to fix these machines when their profitability goes up when they don't? And it wouldn't be the first time in the history. It might be the millionth time in the history of companies trying to make money of them doing something like this. You're absolutely right, Erica. You know, if, if there's anything that I trust less than the government, it's corporate America. And if they can, if they can turn a penny into two, they're going to do it without uh, without a shadow of a doubt. If they can turn a dollar into a dollar one, they're going to do it without a shadow of a doubt. And thank you for engaging in this discussion with me today, Erica. And to everybody who's out there listening, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today to be informed and stay informed about the hottest stories in the criminal injustice system. Police, government accountability, ignition interlock devices, and all of your constitutional and civil rights, look to the law office of brianjones.com, facebook.com slash central Ohio criminal defense, and at T-L-O-B-J on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll be back in two weeks with a sui generis perspective on the next big thing in civil rights and the criminal injustice system as well as another alcohol electronic monitoring tool called the Scram Cam. Erica, when I parted ways with my grandfather, he would always tell me, hey kid, don't do anything I wouldn't do. And to that, when I part ways with my friends today, I add, if you do and you get caught, call me. I'll defend your rights as I'd want mine defended. <laughs>